Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. You've been blessed, I'm sure, if you've been with us in this series, God's Mission, My Mission, mm -hmm. Your Mission too, as we join God in what He's doing in the world. Today, Mission to the Unreached, mm. billions of people on planet Earth who've never heard about a God who loves them mm -hmm. with an immeasurable and unfailing love. Mm -hmm. The message of the only true God, creator of the heavens and the earth. We're going to study how we can be part of that mission today. So welcome to Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to the team. An important topic today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. Mission to the unreached. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you're here. And we've got some remote team members with us. Puya, great to have you back with us. Glad you're here today. Amy, good to have you back. And Leah, great to have you with us today as we're studying an important topic. And we're glad that you're with us too. Wherever you are around the world, you're part of our Hope Sabbath School team. Not a passive observer, mm -hmm. but an active participant. Yeah. I always like when people write to me and say, Pastor Derek, when the teacher asks a question, I'll raise my hand <laughs> because we're part of the study together. You know, one thing that's happening, team, is uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel is growing exponentially. Amen. We're approaching about 100,000. If you watch us on YouTube, you're part of that. And we get many comments on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Here's one from Jenny. And she says, I love Hope Sabbath School so very much. It is one of the biggest blessings mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. As I seek to grow in spiritual wisdom and knowledge and become more like Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, I want to tell you, Jenny, you just made it all worthwhile mm -hmm. when you shared your testimony with us. Jenny concludes, may the Lord continue to bless Hope Sabbath School. Mm -hmm. And we say amen. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for writing amen. to us. Here is a note from uh, Homer and Jeannie here in the United States of America. And Homer writes, Jeannie and I watched Hope Sabbath School this morning with great interest as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've been watching Hope Sabbath School since it went on to direct TV years ago. For those of you who are around the world, direct TV is a major satellite network in the United States. I think goes to about uh, 50 million people, mm -hmm. 23 million homes. So they've been watching on direct TV. We now watch on our iPad. <laughs> okay, high tech. By the way, Homer says, I will soon be 92. Oh. And Jeannie will be 90 oh, in a few wow. months. Carry on with the message. I love the last sentence, Homer. Thank you. Amen. Each soul saved is a win for Jesus and a loss for Satan. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for writing to us. Um, and God bless you. Not sure where you are in the U.S., but... Uh, Thank you for being part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Here is a handwritten note from Georgia in the United States of America. And the, the donor couple, no, a donor individual writes and says, I'm so happy to have Hope Channel available. Oh, no, maybe it's a couple because it says we begin our Sabbath with Hope Sabbath School and enjoy it very much. Appreciate all those who participate in such a blessed program. Mm. And enclosed is a small donation. Well, it's not small. Thank you, uh, donor couple in, Flo in uh, Georgia, for a donation of $100. Thank you. Amen. you multiply that by 1,000 people, and you have a significant contribution to the global evangelistic media work. Thanks for writing to us. One last note from Freddie. Freddie lives in South Africa. Mm. Mm. And Freddie writes, I've been following Hope Sabbath School for about seven years, mm. and I enjoy the studies with the team every time. I am part of an Afrikaans congregation mm. in Pretoria with much love and dedication. You know, one reason we speak slowly and clearly is because the vast majority of our Hope Sabbath School team members, English is a second or maybe even a third language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though we're an international language, we're not the only place in the world, right, yeah. Kenneth? Yep. Yep. There are other languages. Yeah. This uh, brother belongs to an Afrikaans congregation in South Africa. And Freddie concludes by saying, 
Please give my greetings to the team. <laughs> well, let's give Freddie a wave. Freddie. Thanks for being part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Right now, we'd like to invite you to help us with our theme song. Mm -hmm. I've been singing it for a long, long time because I really do want to praise the Lord with my whole heart and tell of all His marvelous works. It's from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2, an ancient scripture song. My wife put a simple melody to it to help mm -hmm. us to hide it in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Let's sing it together. You know, one time I remember complaining that I had to sing in front of people. Mm. And the Spirit of God rebuked me and said, Derek, you still don't understand. This isn't about you. <laughs> this is about my word. Amen. And so wherever you are, sing with us. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Amen. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell about your marvelous works. I will be glad. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together as we begin our study today. Our Father in heaven, what an important topic in this series on God's mission, my mission, because you have a special mission to those who've never heard that you love them with an immeasurable and unfailing love. And we recognize that you could just use angels or write a message in the sky, but you've chosen to use your children who know you to share the good news with those who've never heard. As we study today about mission to the unreached, I pray the Holy Spirit, who gives us power to be witnesses for Jesus, would guide us in our study and bless everyone who watches or hears this program. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 We're going to start our study in Acts chapter 16. I don't know, has anybody here been to Macedonia? <laughs> You've been to Macedonia, Gladys. That's, that's actually north part of Greece, isn't it? It's a separate country. I don't want to get confused here because Paul was in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And, and he was told to do something that would lead him to Macedonia. Yes. That's right. So let's take a look at that. Acts chapter 16, we'll begin our study. Sean, if you could read for us verses 6 through 10, and uh, let's see how the Holy Spirit mm. redirected Paul's mm -hmm. travel itinerary. Yes, I'd be happy to. I'll be reading from the New International Version, Acts 16, 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Mm. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where a map would be helpful, but the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul had been in what we call modern Turkey and the Asia Minor mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. 
and God had blessed their ministry there, mm -hmm. but now God is going to call them across what we call the Aegean Sea mm -hmm. to Macedonia. How did he accomplish that? How did he catch Paul's attention? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Tendi? Um, through a vision. That's right. Mm -hmm. Through a vision. He, I mean, that's a more powerful than the text message, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he gives him a vision. Now, I heard that story in the past, but, but Amy, uh, if you could help us, because you know uh, the Asia Minor area, um, he's not just calling him to go to an, uh, another place, but what was significant about the continent that we now call Europe? Why was this trip over to Macedonia so significant? This was really significant because he's taking him outside of what was considered reached area or local area. He was calling him cross-culturally to a completely new place, completely different place than he had ever been. And this is actually, as I understand it, the first time the gospel is mm. taken to what we call the European continent. Wow. It's been in Asia Minor. It's obviously been in Israel, right? Mm -hmm. But it's being taken across to Macedonia. What does that tell us about God's care for the unreached? Mm. Sean? It tells us that he is willing to work miracles That's in true. order to get the message to them. Right. That's so important. It's not like, well, let's see where it goes. Right. It's like, no, I want it to go to Guinea-Bissau, where Lalika grew up. I want it to go to Ghana, where Kenneth grew up. Mm. I want it to go to Botswana, where Tendi grew up. I even want it to go to the UK, where Derek grew up. Yes. Mm. I care about those unreached areas of the world. Amen. And so, thank you. He's willing to use a miracle for that to happen. Well, let's see what happens, Travis. Acts 17 and verse 16. When uh, he gets over to Macedonia and then he comes down what we call modern Greece and gets to a very influential city called Athens. That was one of the world empires, wasn't it? Remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Babylon. Medo-Persia, yes. Greece, Greece. Greece. Mm -hmm. significant area yet to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. What does the Apostle Paul find when he gets to Athens? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was, giving, or was given over to idols. Mm. Mm. Does, does anyone have another translation besides given over to idols? Sean? Mm. Uh, my translation says it was full of idols. Now, Puya, I want to I want to ask you a question because I know you've lived in many parts of the world, um, and you've actually been in parts of the world where there were lots of idols, right? Yes, so, I I grew up in Myanmar, uh, where the majority of the people, about ninety five percent or so of the people, are Buddhist, and so we have idols everywhere growing up in our country. So uh, stay with us, Puya. How do you think Paul felt? He'd been speaking primarily in synagogues and to people who weren't necessarily overtly pagan. How do you think he felt when he got to a very sophisticated city, but it was full of idols? I think for one, Paul would have been out of his comfort zone, uh, probably something that he was not used to seeing everywhere like idols everywhere. And as the text indicated, his spirits were stirred, like something uh, was bothering him. And he had a desire to, to, to share the good news. Because when people worship false gods and you have a personal relationship with a risen Savior, the true God of the universe, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul must have felt that strong desire to 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 share that good news so that these people who don't know the true God would also come to enjoy a personal relationship with uh, God. Amen. Thank you, Puya. So I want to ask you a question. Um, we're talking about mission to the unreached. unreached. Mm -hmm. What could I expect if I follow the Holy Spirit's leading to move to an unreached people group. Mm -hmm. What could I expect, uh, Kenneth? Yeah, God wants you to be a missionary. That's right. Okay. Uh, this is not like, well, I've done, been there, done that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. Things will be different. It will it be is out going of to your be comfort different. zone. Right, right. 
they're going to be different uh, worldviews. Mm -hmm. They're going to be uh, different deities yeah. Yeah. other than yeah. the one true God. Mm -hmm. Let's see how the Apostle Paul handles that. Leah, if you could read for us the following verse in Acts 17 and verse 17, and <clears throat> let's see what we think about his strategy here in this city full of idols. I will be reading Acts 17, verse 17 from the English Standard Version. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Hmm. Okay, talk to me about that strategy. What do you think? Lalika, what do you think? He's talking in the synagogue mm -hmm. to Jews and believing oh. Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the marketplace. Yes, in the marketplace with those who do not know anything about God or our God and Jesus. So he definitely used different methods. Um, we will uh, learn about that later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Travis and then Puya. I love that it doesn't say he instructed them. Mm. Ah. It says he reasoned with them. Mm. He's appealing to their common sense. He's That's appealing. Right. When you reason with someone, there's a dialogue. You, mm -hmm. you, you want to know how they feel, but and you're sharing something with them by reason, something that would make sense to them. So I just really love the way that the writer puts that across. We get this idea that he wasn't in their face, mm. but he was he was appealing to their conscience. Mm -hmm. All right, several hands raised. I want to come back to what Lalika said, though, because I think it's very important. He didn't say... I'm in the synagogue. Anybody who wants to hear, come to the synagogue. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the only place I'm going to talk about it. If you don't yes. come, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> He's out there in the marketplace, too. Mm -hmm. I want to recognize Puya, and then I'll come to two hands raised here with the group. Um, Pastor Derek, what I find here is that Paul first started with uh, his own people. Uh, he started with the Jews oh. Oh. in mm -hmm. the synagogue. And then he reached out to the uh, Gentiles believers who mm -hmm. have already uh, worshipped God, uh, probably wanting to share with them about Jesus specifically. And then finally, the unreached uh, people in that city. And so I believe the uh, tactic or the approach that Paul used here is to start with his immediate circle, mm -hmm. uh, sir, um, environment that he's um, uh, used to um, and he's comfortable with, and then pushing the boundary further mm. out to mm -hmm. the unreached area that he probably don't know how to approach yet, and he's observing and learning. Thank you yeah. so much, Priya. That's an interesting point. I was reminded as you were speaking about Jesus saying, start in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judea. Judea. Then Judea. Yeah. 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 Then Samaria. The rest of the world. And then to the ends of the earth. Yeah. So I wonder if when he was speaking in the synagogue, to the Jews and the, the believing Gentiles, he said, do you have any friends <laughs> that you think might be open? Mm. Uh, yeah. We could talk in the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for pointing that out, Puya. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey. Oh, I was about to say what Puya was trying to say. It's okay to start small. Yes. Okay. And then expand. We think that we have to start big or go home. Mm. But really, you know, mm. like Jesus with a Samaritan woman, Mm. is you start one small, person. one That's person. Right. That's right. So start somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Puya made a good point. Start where there's already some common ground, Kenneth. Yeah, th there's a beautiful thing when you preach on the marketplace. Mm. One, mm. it's free. <laughs> and people, you know, people have come there to, you know, trade in all sorts of things. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, you, you're not going to only find people who come from that country or that city. Mm -hmm. People from all market. over the world. Okay. So even if the person just listening to once, he carries with him yeah. or her the message yeah. to wherever he's going to. Mm -hmm. So it was a great strategy for Paul. Amen. So I want to ask a question, and then I'll come to Gladys here. Has anybody ever gone and tried to talk about Jesus in the marketplace? It's not that easy, it's is not. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a level of courage, courage. Yes. to stand yeah. out there in a marketplace in a city full of idols mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and start talking uh, about faith, right? Faith mm -hmm. in the one true God. Gladys? And I also think that, that his strategy included adapting to the culture mm -hmm. because Greeks were known for their big philosophy de debates in the, in the open mm -hmm. spaces. People would come and listen to great philosophers. So I think for him to start 
debating or reasoning with with the, with the, those that believe first in the synagogue and the marketplace, it was con also conforming to what they already knew. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look, Tendi. Let's keep reading, if we can, in Acts 17. If you could read verses 18 to 21, because Gladys says, in that culture, discussing themes, philosophy, worldviews, if you mm -hmm. want to use that language, yeah. uh, in open places was quite common. In common. fact, yeah. he says at one point, that's all people did all the time, mm -hmm. which yeah. sounds a little counterproductive. We <laughs> yeah. like to do something besides talk. Yeah. But let's look, Acts 17, verses 18 to 21. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? <laughs> Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Mm. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? Mm. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else <laughs> but either to tell or to hear some new thing. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, Kenneth, you were right that uh, Marketplace was an international gathering spot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he's talking, reasoning with them, and they're always talking about some new idea, some new thought. Uh, why, why was that, again, a good strategy? And by the way, they want to move him, don't they? Mm -hmm. It says they want to take him mm -hmm. where? To the council. To the Areopagus. Yeah. And yeah. what was that? Yeah. As a court. Does anybody? My, my uh, version says high council of the city. The high council of the city. Mm -hmm. So it was a location mm -hmm. of yeah. prominence. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Travis? It was also a place of idols where they would worship. And when we get that as we read further on, that he's mm -hmm. walking about and there's just idols. Yeah. Right. Uh, in fact, he said there's the city was full of idols, right. including yes. there, right? Yes. Yep. So this is a prominent location. Mm -hmm. what, what, are they, what are they doing? Why are they taking him up onto this mm -hmm. prominent location? Sean? It's the main place of debate for their time. Mm -hmm. It's where, as we already read, they can exchange ideas, but this is where the top-notch philosophers are. You really got to know your stuff if you're going to go debate there. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like, uh, Leah? What would that look like in the 21st century? Now, now some of us live in the United States of America, but m many Hope Sabbath School members live in other countries. But... Uh, what would the Areopagus, the high place for discussion, look like uh, where you live? I was studying this and I was trying to think of a comparable location in modern day that this would take place. And I suppose it might be a school, a university, a place of higher education, uh, maybe where philosophy is taught, someone is brought in to, you know, kind of speak what they have to say. I think it's very interesting that these are extremely well-versed, well-educated people, and they just spend all their time thinking about philosophy and theory, and they hear this new thing, and they, they're intrigued. They want more. And I suppose that would be a school. So thank you for pointing that out. There are some courageous, uh, we would call them Christian apologists. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're apologizing. Right, it right. means that they are defending the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. who will go to Harvard or to mm -hmm. Yale or to mm -hmm. some university, the University of Zambia or wherever. They'll go to Botswana. They'll go to, as Leah said, a key place of learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they may have, to have a discussion with an animist and a pantheist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe a person of another worldview sharing why the Christian worldview makes sense and is good news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could that be the Areopagus of today? Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, where else could it be, though? Maybe it isn't a building at all. What do you think, Lalika? Uh, as you, you're uh, talking, I thought about TED Talk. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, TED on, Talks. On internet, <laughs> YouTube. And uh, yeah. TED Talk, uh, for those who don't know, we've got international audience here, short presentations uh, watched by 
tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Are they all present in the building? No. no. Uh, no. How do they watch the TED Talk? Anybody know? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so the, after the presentation, it is recorded, and that recording can be found on the YouTube or mm -hmm. any of the media. streaming media. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe Hope Sabbath School on YouTube mm -hmm. is, is one of the, an Areopagus mm -hmm. yes. yeah. for today. Yeah. What about social media? What yeah. about yes. the internet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, not necessarily a building, right? Amy, what do you think? I think really the Areopagus is anywhere where you can get an audience with the gatekeepers of the society that you're in. Mm. So if the, if they're the professors at the university, then it's at the university. But if it's if you're working with a family or you're working in a small village, then maybe it's the the elderly men of the the community, the chiefs and the fathers. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of depends on where you're at. But really, the key I think is getting to the gatekeepers of whatever community you're in. Well said. Mm -hmm. I appreciate having Amy, who's worked overseas with her husband for many years, uh, because it isn't just the Harvard and the mm -hmm. Yale and the mm -hmm. University of London. It, it may be with the village elders in mm -hmm. a Maasai yeah. village mm -hmm. settlement, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The place where the leaders gather to talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Travis, you mentioned, and if you'd read verse 23 of Acts 17, you mentioned that while he's going up, to the Areopagus, mm -hmm. he's not just daydreaming, he's mm. looking. Yeah. He's noticing the environment, and according to the text recorded by Dr. Luke, who was traveling with him, uh, what did Paul notice as he was going up to this high place of, uh, of learning and discussion? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> what do you think about that? Was that, was that just, uh, yes, Leah, was that just uh, kind of good fortune that he saw that, or was that Holy Spirit led? What's, what's going on here? Did he have that strategy when he woke up that morning? What do you think? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> um, that was that was God's leading for sure. But like I said earlier, I think it's so interesting that these are very well educated people and they spend all their time going over and over these same theories and topics. Now they're hearing they're hearing something new. And I can't help but imagine that they were missing something in their lives. And, you know, here's this unknown God that they claim to believe in or are searching for. And Paul's like, well, guess what? <laughs> I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I can imagine people going, tell us more, yeah. right? Uh, everybody, would you agree with Leah that all of the above? Yeah. Like he had a strategy, but it's unfolding. He's yes. watching. He's praying, yes. Yes. right? Mm -hmm. So he finds some common ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a God, the one true God, that he wants mm -hmm. to tell them about and they have an altar, That's right. instead of saying to them, you're not supposed to build altars to all these gods. Why, why, do, you, why do you think that strategy, uh, Amy and Puri, I see your hands there, uh, of trying to find where, where's the bridge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Puri, talk to us about that. Where's the bridge that can connect us, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll share other things you don't know yet. I, I find here uh, interesting that Paul complimented that first for their uh, devotion to uh, being religious. Mm -hmm. And I believe we can learn a great deal of lesson here from Paul that instead of uh, just uh, condemning uh, false ideas or false religion, um, find common ground, build that relationship in a respectful attitude. Even though this was different from his worldview, he came with uh, the idea of respectfully dialoguing with them and as you pointed out, he, he, he built that common ground. He could have said, oh, this, this is a, uh, like a weird idea or a, uh, an unwise idea to just build a random altar to the unknown God. But uh, Paul used that as an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to, to bridge that. So it's like you, you people are religious enough to the point that you even built an altar to mm -hmm. an unknown God just in case you missed you know, a God. 
and I'm here to tell you about the God that you don't know. And so I believe that was a very good uh, approach. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Amy, I'm going to take your comment next because uh, it seems that it's very important to build that bridge. I want us, after your comment, to talk about different religions and worldviews where we live and mm -hmm. how we can build bridges. What common ground do we have? Amy? I really like this story. And as you mentioned, Pastor Derek, my husband and I have been in Asia for a long time as missionaries. And something that we've learned, a mantra that we've kind of adopted is no problem, no mission. Mm. The, the idea is, is that you have to find a place where there is a problem in the community. And yet Paul does this beautifully where he sees not only, um, a, he sees, like Puyo was saying, he's complimenting them that they are so spiritual, they're so devout, they're so religious. But then he's also saying, look, you've got a problem. You've got this one little, this little statue plaque and I need to give you the name. So like he sees that this is a problem that they don't know who this God is. And so I'm going to give you the name. But what they didn't realize is that he was also going to tell them who this God was and how he fit and how it was going to totally change their perception of how the universe worked. Um, but yeah, this was a bridge, but it also included a bit of a piece of a problem that he was able to solve and thereby build some rapport. Thank you, Amy. I've never heard the saying, no problem, no mission, but, okay. but I, I, I have heard, find out what the felt need is, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Because if Jesus can meet that felt need, by the mm -hmm. way, can Jesus meet felt needs? Absolutely. Yes. 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 If Jesus can meet it, that's a place where we could mm -hmm. start, yes. right, mm -hmm. Travis? You know, Derek, as they were talking, I was just thinking of the hymn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, mm -hmm. look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the world grow strangely dim mm -hmm. in the light of his glory and grace. I think this is Paul's bridge. It's Jesus. You, he could go there and say, that stuff's not good, this is better, but he could introduce them to a loving Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those things will, be, will just fall off the more in love they fall with Jesus. Yes. Now, Puya used some important words. He talked about respect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he talked about not uh, being critical or condemning, but being, what was the word? Um, I guess we would say... Respectful. Respectful mm -hmm. and, and finding what we have in common. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I saw a couple of hands raised. Maybe you can add your comment to this discussion. Think of some people that live in your community. And I'd like to invite you watching us on Hope Sabbath School to think about some people in your community who don't know about the one true God, creator of heaven and mm -hmm. the earth, who loved us so much that he sent his own son to save us. They don't know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. good news. Mm -hmm. What common ground might we find with our Hindu neighbor, our Muslim neighbor, mm -hmm. our um, Buddhist neighbor, our, we have a new category of religion, we call it none, Mm -hmm. N-O-N-E, mm -hmm. that means no religion, I'm nothing, right? Mm -hmm. right? None. What, what common ground could I find? Maybe you could, thinking of a neighbor, mm -hmm. you say, I have a yeah. neighbor that's like that. What common ground could I find that yeah. could come respectful, Sean, mm -hmm. and respectful and seeing where there's a bridge? Yeah, absolutely. I think of, as you said, the nuns. Of course, N-O-N-E-S, right. not nuns Catholicism, but right. who don't have affiliation. Right. And one thing I found about a lot of them, they love to serve. Mm -hmm. They love to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So very often when I encounter a neighbor like that, I invite them with me to go serve other people so they can see Jesus' love in action, mm -hmm. and then I can connect them to something greater than themselves. So you mm -hmm. notice that mm -hmm. Jesus calls us to serve others mm -hmm. in love. That's right. This person who has no religious affiliation has what we call an altruistic spirit right. mm -hmm. or a desire to do good without mm -hmm. any compensation. Mm -hmm. Right. Ah, there's, there's a exactly. common ground. Yes. Somebody else. Yes, Lelika. Uh, being uh, nice or complimenting someone is not about being weak or avoiding uh, the truth. It's about opening up uh, the keys. 
instead of locking, putting seven kids in a door that is already shut. So if you compliment someone, because everybody has something good to say about, mm. like uh, these um, people that we read, they were so spiritual to the point of building an altar just in case they are not missing anything to <laughs> an unknown God. So that thing Paul saw and he complimented that, that opened the keys that is needed to their souls so they can listen to you with the respect that you demonstrated in honoring them and the va validating them in what... Okay, Lalika, mm -hmm. let's talk about your country back home, Guinea-Bissau. What's the primary religion back home? It's animism, people who worship the devil, demon, through spirits. And so you've got a primary... <laughs> wow, that's kind of intense, isn't it? Mm -hmm. These are animists, they worship dead, dead people or... Uh, um, spirits in the spirit world. Yes. So you say, oh, Derek, I don't feel like I have anything in common with people that do that. We don't want to encourage that, right? right. We don't want to affirm that. Where, where might you build a bridge with someone uh, from your home country that's grown up with that kind of uh, mm. religious view? We have so many things in common. We come from the same land that gave us birth. Okay. Mm. We, we fight for the same causes. So the religion is something that we can sit down with a respect and honor toward each other and talk about without trying to put our views into each other. But let us reason together. Mm -hmm. Why is it that I believe in what I believe? What, what is it that I can share with you? Not just I come from, uh, um, that is the, the, the reality of my country. We have also, also, also Islam that is growing. We used to be pretty much uh, Catholic or other uh, Christian religion. But um, in coming all of us together, we can minister to each other first. So maybe the simplest bridge is, you're from Guinea-Bissau, yeah. I'm from Guinea-Bissau. Yeah. Let's yeah. sit down and have a meal and let's, that, that's kind of, you say, that's a little bridge, but it's a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we're reaching the unreached. Uh, Gladys and then Tendi. Yeah, I was a missionary in Philippines in a very uh, Muslim area. It was just, um, there was no other religion in that area that we were sent. And it was interesting that we would wake up really early in the morning to pray, and that was our bridge. Mm. Our neighbors saw us getting up, singing, and praying. And they said, oh, I didn't know that the Christians pray mm. so much. <laughs> and we were like, oh, yeah. So we sat and started talking about prayer. And they shared their views on how they did the prayer and why. And we did the same thing. And a friendship developed because mm. of prayer. Because yeah. prayer is an important element of their mm. faith. Yes. Tendi? Um, an act of kindness. Yep. Sometimes mm. being kind is a bridge that is needed and showing interest in people's mm. uh, beliefs or lives. Yeah. What I like about Paul is that he showed interest mm. um, in these people's beliefs mm. and he was also consistent. Yeah. Mm. He went to the marketplace daily to reason with them. So you need to be consistent mm. in your kindness and getting to know your neighbors. Mm. So if, if we learn some lessons, and then I'll come to Amy, if we've learned some lessons here, we come with respect, mm -hmm. we come with kindness, mm -hmm. we find a bridge, even if it's a small bridge, like I'm from this city and you're from that city, mm -hmm. you know? You may worship uh, an evil spirit, I may worship the creator God of heaven and earth, but we find a place where we can begin. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. We're going to go on after Amy's comment to chapter 17 of Acts 24 to 27 and see how it works out. Amy? Fundamentally, we're all looking to be successful in life, mm -hmm. whatever that may look like and however we get there. But typically, we all want to have good health. We want to have a good family. We want to have enough money to pay for our needs and maybe a little extra. And these are areas that we can find common ground in with everybody. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is that just as Paul found that there was a commonality, there's also a little bit of a difference. Yes. How I choose to find success in my life is going to look different than how my Buddhist friend looks for uh, success in their life. And so as they're seeing how God is blessing me and how I am finding blessing through my relationship with God, then they're going to start wanting to ask questions as we dialogue about how to find success in life. Well, Amy, how is it that you were sick last week and now you're fine? You know, I was sick a couple of weeks ago and it took me three weeks to get better. You know, little differences where they're going to start seeing, wow, 
Amy's method is working and it's different than mine. I want to learn a little bit more about that. So it's partially curiosity. We need to be curious about how they're finding success, but then it's also about allowing living our life in such a way that people can see how we're living life and how we're leaning on God and how we're gaining the blessings from our relationship with God to have a successful life. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, as Amy was sharing that, thank you for sharing, I thought back to one of my wife's relatives mm -hmm. who was a young man in Hong Kong. He was from China, but living in Hong Kong, and boys were disappearing mm. during the war, and mm. they never came back. Mm. The, the rumor was they were being taken for their blood. Mm. And someone said, how much blood? And they said, we don't know. They just never come back. Mm. So this young man, my wife's uncle, was mm. there. And his family, actually a sister in Australia, said, we need to get you out of there deep into mainland China, which was not under control of hostile forces. Mm. And he was put on a ship, a pirate ship, to get him across to the Chinese mainland, but the waters were being patrolled. Mm -hmm. During that night journey, another pirate ship attacked them. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, what are we going to do here? Well, the pirates took them to a little cabin and locked them up, and there was shooting during the night. And my wife's uncle noticed a group of Christians. They were actually mm. Seventh-day Adventist missionaries. Mm. Wow. Mm. And they, she, he saw something about them mm. that was different. Mm. Mm. He saw peace. Mm. Mm. Amen. In the midst of the, the storm. storm. The storm. You say, well, did anybody survive? Yes, my wife has, had an uncle. Um, <laughs> but they made it into the, deep into the interior where he went to a Seventh-day Adventist mission school mm -hmm. and became a devoted follower of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. But, but it was what he saw. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't a sermon in a church. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, a theological discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. It was life. Mm -hmm. yes. And seeing something there that really brought conviction. So Amen. maybe that's what's important. Well, let's go on. And I'm mm. going to ask Jeffrey if you'd read for us uh, in Acts 17, verses 24 to 27. By the way, my wife's uncle sleeps in Jesus, but he's going to rise when Jesus comes again. Amen. Because he remained a faithful follower of Jesus his whole life. Amen. He never looked back. Hallelujah. Uh, he could have died as a teenager there in in Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. But he never looked back. But the greatest sermon to the unreached was the peace of Christ Amen. in someone's heart. Mm -hmm. wow. Jeffrey, let's let's see what uh, Paul does now. We <laughs> we know he's guided by the Holy Spirit. Acts 17, verses 24 to 27. All right, I'll be reading from the New International Version. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in the temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. <laughs> Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history in the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him mm. and find him, though he is not far from any one mm. of us. Amen. Amen. So once you found the common ground, I'm from Guinea-Bissau too, or uh, I, I went to that school too, mm -hmm. uh, he goes on with something very theological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's not, well, you've got your gods and I've got my God. Mm -hmm. What does he say about this unknown God that he's mm -hmm. going to tell them about? Stephanie? All right. Um, I was just thinking that he actually tells them this is who this unknown God is, mm -hmm. and he explains. And, and, and he is the creator, creator of the heavens yeah. and the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's right. not one of the creators of the heavens mm -hmm. and the earth. He is the creator. Mm -hmm. is, is that a message that still needs to be heard today? Oh, yes. absolutely, yes. yes. What, what's the confusion that we're mm -hmm. hearing today? Mm -hmm. 
So he came from monkeys or... We evolved in some way. By the way, I talked to a scientist one time. He was an educated man. And he said, this theory is the best we can do if we start with the presupposition mm -hmm. that there's no God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess we'd agree. Mm -hmm. We got here somehow. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we start with the presupposition there's no God, mm -hmm. um, then, but he can write out and he mm -hmm. says, the one God I'm telling you about, he's creator of the heavens and the mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's Lord of all. Yes. What Amen. kind of reaction are we going to get in our culture? Um, but yeah, I see your hand. I don't know if you want to respond to my question or you want to just uh, make a comment, but after that, what kind of reaction would we get today, whatever country you're from, if you say, I know you're being taught this, but I'm here to tell you that there is one true God and He is the creator mm. of the mm. heavens and the earth. Leah? In these verses, he not only gives identity to their unknown God, but he explains who he is in all of his majesty, but then he makes it personal. And I think the most beautiful reaction anyone could have gained from this message is that I'm not alone. There's someone who made me and who loves me, and I can't imagine getting better news than that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Hopefully the next question after he's made this bold declaration mm -hmm. would be what? The next question would be, or the next request would be what? How can I get to know him? Yeah. 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 How yeah. could I connect with yeah. this God? Mm -hmm. Tell me more, more. more, more. about him. Mm -hmm. And what did you notice in that last uh, phrase that really mm, could catch their attention. Did you notice that, Kenneth? Yeah, he said he's not far from each <laughs> one of us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's not a God who created like the deists mm -hmm. believed and then right. left Under it. Us. He doesn't care about anything or communicate in any way. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he is not far from, from us. any of us. That's right. From yeah. any of us. Yeah. So let's talk about that for today. What are some ways? Someone says, well, tell me how. You're saying that there is a God creator of the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. I've got people at my school or my university who are telling me there's no God. We're here by uh, basically a cosmic mm -hmm. accident. Mm -hmm. And they've done their best science to try to explain how such remote possibility could happen, mm -hmm. which is an act of faith in itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me more about this God. Um, he's not far from us. What are some mm -hmm. ways people might become aware that God is not far from us. Mm. Mm. Anybody? What are some ways? They say, well, tell me some ways that you've seen that God is not far from us. Kenneth? Usually I tell them that, what is it that you're going through? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just pray to Him and mm. test it for yourself mm -hmm. and see if you find this God that I'm talking about. And they will come and confess that, yes. I feel impressed that God's heard my prayers. Amen. All right, is it Gladys? Yes, I, I go to prison ministry uh, and uh, one of the prisoners yesterday was sharing that he wants to come to church and he mm -hmm. wants to study his Bible, but he never has time. So that every time he wants to open his Bible and pray, somebody comes and says, I need you to do this, I need mm -hmm. you to do that, because he cuts hair in prison. Mm -hmm. And he, he gets demands all the time. And he says, well, I want money, so I want to do that. So I put up a, ch a, a challenge for him. I say, you know, last week I was very busy with things and I disregarded reading my Bible. So I made a deal with God. I said to God, if you wake me up with enough time that I will read my Bible and do everything else that I need to do. He, I would study my Bible for the time that you give me, the extra mm -hmm. time that you give me. So God woke me up every day at four in the morning and I will fight with him and be like, I don't wanna get up, but I made a deal, so I, I did it. And he said, God does that? He wakes you up? I said, yes, wide awake. And I have to get up and do what I said because I had to do my part. He said, I'm going to try to do that because I really want to learn more about God. So when they understand that God is personable mm -hmm. and that, they, that He comes and meets you where you are, mm -hmm. they're intrigued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you gave your testimony. Yes. I'm not sure I like the word making a deal with God, but I understand <laughs> what you're saying. You made an agreement together, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. but you gave your testimony. At that point, if that prisoner that you talked to 
says, well, I'm going to try. The miracle's up to God, right? Amen. It's not yes. up to you. Right. Yes. If that's how yeah. God wants to meet him, mm -hmm. will. But, but one thing we know, he doesn't want to be far from us, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. I see a couple of hands. Travis. You know, I think getting involved in ministry has made me see how close God is to us. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked with you earlier this morning, Derek, on the phone, and I uh, shared with you some of the things that God has done in ministry. It's like, you pray for something and make a request, and the next day it happens. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, and then, and then the next week, another thing happens, and another, and you're like, God, you're amazing. Yes. God, God is just wanting to act on mm -hmm. behalf of His children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And records by the prophet Jeremiah comes to mind, call to me, mm -hmm. and, I will answer. and I will answer you. Yes. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, and show you great, great and, and mighty things. things. Now, the miracle is God's, That's right. but you're saying, I can say, here's mm -hmm. how God has shown Himself near to me, yes. yeah. praying to wake up mm -hmm. with a ministry assignment. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, but God, ultimately, now I give this person to you yes. mm -hmm. to see that God is not far from us. I'm mm -hmm. going to take a couple of hands raised, and then we want to continue reading in verses 28 to 31. Puya. I, I believe, yes, we're going eventually to the greatest revelation that God is close to us through the person of Jesus Christ. But before that, I believe nature is a good way to learn that the creator of mm -hmm. uh, all of these is not far away as... As, as I live now in Hawaii, I, I walk to the, you know, the beach and I hike mountains and just spending time in nature makes you wonder about the, the way this planet in a way is specially designed for, for us to enjoy and, you know, learn more about this, this world. And something about, I believe, nature tells us that the Creator it's not far away. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Amy, would you like to follow up on Puya's comment? A little bit. I had a little different idea that I'd like to share first, and that is earlier I shared my mantra, no problem, no mission. And when I see problems in people's lives, it's an opportunity for me to host God to do something in their life, mm -hmm. right? I can invite God into that problem and say, you know, whether they're an unbeliever or they're a believer. It doesn't matter. God wants to be where the problems are. And so I can invite God through prayer with and for that person and invite God to do something, whatever he sees fit to do in their life, mm -hmm. to help them to see that he is real, that he loves them and that he cares for them. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to look for the problems mm -hmm. for the purpose of praying God into those spaces, Amen. to introduce people to him and, and the power and his love and his mercy and whatever it is that they need to experience from God. Mm -hmm. well, we want to hear the rest of the story. Jeffrey, if you could read still in Acts 17, 28 to 31, because as uh, uh, Puya pointed out, he's about to go from not only creative heavens and the earth, mm -hmm but the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it reads in verses 28 to 31 of Acts 17. All right, reading from the New International Version. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of you of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Mm. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent, for He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. Amen. Amen. Stephanie, Amen. read on in verses 32 to 34. How does the crowd respond? He's not only talked about the unknown God being the creator, but the plan of salvation, Son of God coming, dying, mm -hmm. and being raised from the dead. What's the response of the crowd? And the New King James Version says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius and Areopagite, a woman named Damaris and others with them. Hmm. So he uh, 
He said, I'm not going to dilute the truth. Mm -hmm. God's the creator. He loves you. He's not far from you. And God sent his own son to save you. Amen. He died for you and he rose again. What was the reaction? How would you evaluate his effectiveness uh, to this unreached people group? Mm -hmm. Jeffrey? Uh, I think it was uh, separating the wheat from the shaft. It's just mm -hmm. like you don't beat around the bush. You just yeah. get right down to the point. Okay, and Dionysius the Areopagite, that's an unusual word, that means he used to hang out there yeah. at the Areopagus, yeah. right? And Damaris and others with him. Um, what would you say from the outcome? Well, any time a person is, is, chooses Jesus, it's a win. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is, yeah. but I love the fact that it says others thought we'll hear about this later. So, so some just yeah, needed some time. And yeah. I just really like the fact that there was a seed planted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't be discouraged if we know of two by name, but it says others too, yeah. and others said we'll hear more. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say a miracle is underway? Yeah. Yes. That he's built a bridge, Sean? Yeah. yeah, I think of Amy's comment earlier that if you want to change an area, get to the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And Paul here is successful in getting some of those gatekeepers to believe the truth. And now imagine the impact they are all going to have together. Mm -hmm. and, and he could have just said Dionysius and Damaris, but he says Dionysius, the Areopagite, oh, right? right? So he's one of the people up there. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we've started movement. Later he'll say, in Corinth, I've determined to know nothing among you Jesus except Christ, Christ and Him crucified. crucified. Did He make a mistake in Athens? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or do we need to adapt differently in different places? Mm -hmm. We're going to continue this in our next study, ministry or mission to the unreached. But I want to challenge you today. You say, Derek, I was kind of afraid, like I'm not that smart. I don't know everything about people who are different from me. But start by building a bridge. Find out what you have in common. And then with respect, with kindness, give you a testimony mm -hmm. of how the Creator mm. God has revealed His love to you. And the miracle is not your responsibility, my friend. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God is the miracle worker. That's right. Amen. And, and we join Him in His mission. And we will find joy as we see him work in miraculous ways. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the study today from Paul's experience and also the testimonies from the group. Thank you that you will guide us to build a bridge to show respect and love and to, in a careful way, share the glorious truth as found in your word and especially through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Guide us on that journey in our mission to the unreached. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School, part two in the next program, Ministry, Mission to the Unreached. Lots of people need to hear. Go out and be a blessing to those around you.